Nobody wants to save the American penis. Welcome to Down Ballot. We do the show live uh, almost every Tuesday at 7.30 p.m. Pacific right here on Twitch. That's twitch.tv slash Echoplex Media. Uh, you can support this project at patreon.com slash Echoplex or at eplex.store or just go to our website, echoplexmedia.com. Click the support link and find uh, your favorite way to support the show. What is up, the councilman? Oh, this seems... You know... This is going to be an experiment. This I'm all not really seems sure very well broken. I'm be coming through tonight. It's pretty hot. This all seems very broken. Hmm. Yes. So. Yes. So uh, I don't know if we're going to be able to make it happen tonight. <clears throat> yeah. It, that, oh. This. This. This seems. Everybody, if you're not aware, Town Ballot is recorded live, and sometimes whatever is happening now happens, and the councilman is brought to us. Via, um, remember that slideshow projector when your uh, friend's parents would go on vacation? 
That's exactly what it is. Chink, 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 chink. Okay, so uh, what I'm going to do, uh, I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to let you go here, and I think I'm going to run this docket by myself, the councilman. I don't think I can, uh, I don't think I can do it. I don't think we can do it on this this massive delay. Uh, hopefully, hopefully it's just the heat and your internet. I don't know what it is, but anyway, thank you for attempting to join me this week, the councilman, and I'll see you uh, next week for uh, another ish- another edition of the the, the councilman slideshow here at Echoplex Media. All right, everybody. Sometimes you just got to fucking roll with the punches. The uh, councilman had some technical difficulties, so I'm just going to go ahead and run run this one uh, myself. So um, <clears throat> I guess we have kind of a lot to cover, and uh, I don't know that much about it. I do know that the Oakland Mayor, Sheng Tao, and some of her associates had their homes raided and um, as by the feds, and uh, everybody's innocent, though. That's what they're all saying. Um my take on the feds is, I mean, I don't love, I don't love no federal cops, but when they come for you, they probably got gotcha. you. But here's the mayor's uh, reaction to uh, her home being raided. After days of silence, a defiant sounding Oakland mayor stepped in front of cameras at City Hall today and declared she's innocent. And I want to be crystal clear. I have done nothing wrong. I can tell you with confidence that this investigation is not about me. I have not been charged with a crime. Last Thursday, federal agents took multiple boxes with unknown items from Tao's Oakland home. Today, in her prepared statement, the mayor is questioning whether the agents had probable cause. She's also questioning the timing of the FBI search, which came just a day after those looking to recall the mayor announced they had enough signatures to trigger a recall election. Yo, yo, the fucking FBI don't give a fuck about that. FBI got a warrant and searched your house they don't give a fuck he says the reality is that she's being targeted because she didn't grow up rich and privileged i want to know why the day following the qualification of a recall election funded by some of the richest people in the bay area seemed like the right day to execute a warrant nbc has learned no 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 they don't that's not how this works friend they probably got it signed off on the day before. Church of Tao's home is part of a multi-agency investigation that includes the IRS and the United States Postal Inspection. <laughs> what the fuck is the postal post post office? I mean, the post office deals with like internet crime, uh, anything that uses a means of interstate commerce. People don't really realize <clears throat> that, not like what that Russell J. Gould weirdo says, but that the post office does have like broad law enforcement power, actually. Agents also searched two homes owned by members of the Duong family who own Calway Solutions. That's the company that holds the city's recycling contract. Tonight, recall organizers and supporters are fighting back against the mayor's claim that right-winged forces are fueling the recall effort. I have no power over, we have no power over the FBI, the IRS, the U.S. Postal Postal Service. Service. Those signatures that we gathered were not based on some kind of conspiracy. That's right. These are people, common everyday people. Recall supporters are also questioning how much the mayor knew prior to the FBI search and calling for her immediate resignation. Oakland is headed for bankruptcy. We are not going to survive this administration. We cannot afford to keep her in. NBC Bay Area political analyst Larry Gersten believes the lack of information from the FBI may also impact public perception. Yep. What do these people think is going on here? The FBI hasn't said a word one way or the other. So until they clarify this, her comments may fall short in terms of... uh, of alleviating any concerns that the uh, that the, the the city's residents may have, despite questions and a growing chorus of detractors, Mayor Tao remains adamant she will not resign. Well, guess what? Well, what if the, the right thing to do is resign, though? What if some? What if? What if that becomes the case? What if, like, through circumstances that through no fault of your own? I'm not going down like that. We're not going down like that. 
but I will not be bullied and I will not be disparaged and I will not be threatened out of this office. The mayor's comments were all a part of a prepared statement. She refused to answer any questions. Meanwhile, tonight, we know that the attorney who represented her last week has officially withdrawn from her case. Uh oh. The mayor's office says they parted ways. Oh, people be jumping ship. In Oakland, Valina Jones, NBC Bay Area News. So <clears throat> it was really weird that uh, political, I think it was political scientist guy they talked to. They're like, the FBI isn't telling you what they're doing. Uh, no shit. They hand you, uh, they hand you a warrant and they, it says what parts of the house or the whole house and generally what they're looking for. And that's all they tell you, actually. They didn't arrest her. They didn't arrest anybody. It may not be about any of these people. They may have communicated with somebody else who's doing something wrong and they, they actually didn't do nothing. The FBI just needed to get fucking information from them that they were unsure whether or not would be provided. And maybe there was something time sensitive. But I think there's some probably some fucking dirt going on here. <clears throat> I think there's some dirt going on here between her and that family. It's, it requires the fewest assumptions. I mean, who got raided? They were raided essentially at the same time, too. FBI often does that. <clears throat> so that you can't call and be like, I've been raided. But it could be anything. Who knows? All I know is uh, we're moving on to winners and losers where there are no winners. And if you were rooting for anybody, uh, they're not going to win. Uh, turns out uh, Mayor, Mayor Tao's uh, com the communications chief seems to have resigned at a weird time. Mm. That's interesting. The turmoil in the Oakland mayor's office continues. Last week, of course, it was the FBI agent searching her home. Today, it's the resignation of one of her senior staffers. And if that wasn't enough, NBC Bay Area's Valina Jones explains Oakland now has to cut tens of millions of dollars from its budget. And I am your mayor, Mayor Sheng Tao. Hours after the speech, Mayor Sheng Tao's communication director, Francis Zamora, resigned from his position. She was more than just defiant. She was conspiratorial and she was she lost her emotions. Oaklanders need a leader who's going to have. Yeah, a she did sort of deal. suggest that like everybody's out to get me, which is like ain't a good look. <clears throat> and maybe her comms director told her not to do that. And then she did that anyway. And they quit. Because what's the point of being somebody's comms director? They don't fucking listen to you. Because, I mean, I'm not, I'm not in this industry, but what you do is you come out and you say, listen, I haven't been charged with any crime. Either. I, I was not, it was not indicated to me that there was any uh, plan to charge me with any crime. And uh, that's all I know. Having your house raided is scary and it sucks. But I'm still working for the city of Oakland. Well, Zamora did not give a reason for leaving the mayor's office. Also, I'm not sure that was a raid. They like they <clears throat> like the word raid also brings up um, images of what didn't happen, right? <clears throat> they probably knocked and she let them in. Like a raid, do you think of them like busting down the door, throwing in fucking flashbangs, that kind of stuff? colleagues for their professionalism and dedication. Zamora's resignation comes in the midst of turmoil in the mayor's office, including facing a recall election, calls for her resignation, and days of speculation after the FBI searched her home. Former communications director for Mayor Libby Schaff and current media strategist Justin Burton believes the timing is telling. To learn that Francis Zamora, someone of his caliber, resigned just hours after Mayor Tao gave that speech. 100%. He, she fucking didn't listen to the comms department. Her, she fucking didn't listen to her staff. She went out, I'm telling you. That's the, that, right? That, that's, that's what happened. <clears throat> I don't know for sure, but he probably fucking, the, the comms director probably was like, you cannot go out there and do this. He, he might have said something along the lines that you may think this makes you look strong, but this makes you look guilty really suggests that he was no longer comfortable feeling like he can go on with her. Mayor Sheng Tao is adamant she's done nothing wrong. Meanwhile, the city's looking to balance its mid-year budget with $63 million in new proposed cuts. The resolution to the mayor's previous budget was released today to meet their June 30th deadline. The proposed cuts comes as the city is still working to finalize the selling of their part of the Oakland Coliseum. Money the mayor promised would balance the budget. 
But I think she was talking just to make the community feel good about things that were positive that were going to start happening. But now we're finding out that it's not so. And a lot of things that she's promised she can't deliver on. Possible cuts include the library, park maintenance, and OPD, citing a fiscal emergency. Under the proposal, the city says they're unable to budget the required minimum number of 678 police officers. The Oakland Police Officers Association explains the city has already reduced the force and frozen positions, and any more more reductions could impact safety. The association said in part, if our city leaders prioritize public safety, freezing and eliminating police officer positions is not the solution. Without the police, without the law, it's even going to be worse lawlessness. In a statement, the city administrator's office said the options were given to council by request, saying in part these options present significant additional spending cuts for the immediate balancing of the budget, which could be restored for the upcoming fiscal year. In Oakland, Felina Jones, NBC Bay Area News. Yo, yeah, the comms director quit probably because uh, she didn't listen to him. Almost 100%. Because, like, what we saw from her speech was bad. It's not what you do. You don't fucking, you don't go out there and be like, everybody's out to get me. Even if you think so. Because if there are powerful interests out to get you, and that are doing things in an unfair and underhanded way, people find out. You'll find out. And you have your surrogates go out there and fucking dis disseminate that information when it becomes available. <clears throat> what, a, what a shit show. What a fucking shit show. And then you got the cops. Oh, well, if you cut the thing, it might impact public safety if you cut our budget. Well, that sounds like, sounds like more like a threat than anything else, right? When the police unions do that. It seems like <clears throat> they're like, oh, well, it would be a shame if there were to be a bunch more crime because we don't get the budgeting we want for our department. Sounds like kind of mob tactics. Anyway, up next, just, <clears throat> just across the freeway from me, it's a city called Newark. And it looks like one of their council, the city council, had to resign because they fucking can't afford to live in Newark anymore. It's expensive in this part of the Bay Area. It's cheaper than where I was. It's a little cheaper than San Francisco, but this is this is real. Let's see what uh, let's see what's going on with this guy. It is no secret the Bay Area is an expensive place to live. But one city councilman says it's gotten so unaffordable that he has no choice but to resign from the city council and move out of town. Jose Martinez has his story. Housing prices in the Bay Area keep rising. And here in the city of Newark, a council member has decided to resign because he says he's being priced out of town. So now he wonders how people making less money can afford to live here. I'm Newark Memorial, class of 96. I'm as Newark as it gets. It's just not right. This is longtime Newark City Council member Mike Bucci. He can barely hold his tears this Friday after announcing his resignation because he says he's been priced out of town. We've been trying to get in the house for, you know, the better part of 10 years. And we just, you know, we it, it got to a point where we would just offer whatever people were asking and we would still get outbid by, you know, people with huge amounts of cash that paid, you know, 100 grand more than asking. Mike tells me that even though he has been a council member since 2014 and works as a public works estimator at Silman Industries, he can't afford to buy a home in Newark, where, according to Zillow.com, the average home value is in just over $1.3 million, which is up 10.5% over last year. We have a $60,000 down payment, which is a lot more than most people can, can put together to, as a down. And so it's not like that he that, can't afford to live in Newark, it's that he can't afford to buy a house, which is credit. fair enough. I mean, maybe he wants to buy a house. We can't get a better deal than $7,500 a month, and that's not a reality for us. And it's not a reality for many people in this community who make less money, like Cesar Martinez, who works at Taqueria Los Gallos in Newark. Oh, that place is so good. Oakland due to the high cost of living here. He tells me it's exactly what's happening to me because I have to drive for approximately 47 minutes with light traffic. But if the traffic is heavy, it can take me up to an hour and a half. 
And that's why Mike tells me there is a complicated issue of affordability that's pushing people out. He says the city of Newark has been adding units, but developers are buying homes at a very fast pace, making it more difficult to compete. Who's buying these houses? Who can afford them? How anybody can do it without moving you know, eight, ten members of your family in to try and purchase one house. His last day at city council was yesterday, and now he has to start planning his next move to Oxnard. Not without sending a message to those going through the same issue. Let that hit you, man. I'm 47 years old. I've had a great job in the trades for 20 years. I'm a three-term council member in my community and I gotta go move in with my grandma. And Mike tells me now it's time to start imagining a life somewhere else, but he plans to stay connected to a city he thought would be his home forever. So <clears throat> it's that he can't afford to buy a house. And like, I understand, like renting in a way is throwing away money, right? <clears throat> and I mean, that, that does suck. It's not like he was just on the city council. It sounds like he's you know, probably makes what I don't know. I don't know if he's part, if he's got a partner or if they've got kids, but he, he probably makes six hundred thousand dollars a year, right? And you can't buy no house on a hundred thousand dollars a year around here. You can't do that. Fucking crazy town. It's, <clears throat> I keep thinking it's all going to crumble, but it probably won't because, like, like he was saying, like people come in with deep pockets to buy these houses, but the problem is a lot of times those aren't people, right? That's not the person who's going to live there. Somebody's buying that, some company is buying that as an investment opportunity and they're going to rent it out. I remember when HK lived in Sunnyvale, <clears throat> lived in a pretty nice house. And uh, he had said that he didn't meet any of his neighbors that were uh, homeowners. Everybody there was renting. And it seems like these companies are buying up all this uh, residential property. <clears throat> um, and like, whatever, I guess they have every right to do it, but it's a bit, it's like one thing if a comp if a company buys an apartment complex, because that's, that's a place where no people don't plan to own. But it's another when they buy up all the, the the single family homes or even condos where people could own or whatever. That's fucked up. That's so fucked up because then you don't really have a choice but to rent. We're gonna go. We're gonna go a little further away from me, but not very far away from me. It's the city of Union City. Um, apparently, the people there don't want a weed dispensary. Um, fuck them. Weed dispensaries are great. They're good for your uh, property value. And some residents in Union City are pushing back against a proposed marijuana dispensary site that they say will be just too close to a residential area. KTV South Bay reporter Lamonica Peters live. Oh, so like convenient. With more on the story. Like you mean like convenient? Yeah. Is there room in your 15 minute city for a fucking cannabis dispensary? Residents, Lamonica. Mike, I'm here outside of floor, which is one of two dispensaries in Union City, and the people I spoke to say they don't want a third dispensary, especially if it's near homes and schools. So it's not fitting for that to be here based on what we've seen happen in other dispensaries, other areas, just locate it further out in a more... Like, what, what, ha what happens? What ha you know what happens? The only thing that happens is people fucking go try to rob the dispensary. <clears throat> the reason that people would try to burglarize or, or, or do an armed robbery in a dispensary is because they're, a lot of them are unbanked. And so there's a high likelihood they have a lot of cash around. Also, the dispensary, the fucking pigs, even though weed is legal, the pigs are probably going to back burner crimes, like in, investigating crimes that happen at weed dispensaries. That's like the main, the main risk is like <clears throat> you're going to end up being the victim of a crime when you're running a legitimate business and that the, the, the state, which is supposed to protect capital, I suppose, ain't going to protect yours. Some residents in Union City and nearby Fremont say they don't want a new marijuana dispensary operating so close to where people live. Bruce Gill says he lives just a few blocks away from the proposed dispensary site and across from Learn and Play Montessori School on Alvarado Niles Road. Yeah, but that's a private school. We don't want to preach that or have an environment for the kids growing up to see availability or, you know, just inoculate. Them. It's a legal product. And it is a highly regulated product. 
the bat. Embark Dispensaries operates over a dozen shops throughout the state and is petitioning Union City to open the new store. The proposed location used to be an auto shop and sits on an industrial lot. Over here, this is a storage facility. The residents like Mike. Right, that's Garcia. in the, what the fuck, that, what do you mean? That's in the middle, look at this. They're like, oh, it's in my neighborhood. Doesn't look like it's in anybody's neighborhood to me. Maybe it's a 15 minute walk from your neighborhood, but look at it. It's across the street from a fucking empty field say they have concerns about additional traffic and potential crime in a residential area. It was like two groups. They start off a lemonade and then they went back, broke in there, and then they broke into the one on floor. Correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the thing is that like, <clears throat> this isn't their fault. This isn't the fault of the cannabis industry. We, we, this was on car versus building on down ballot like a few months ago. This is like not their fault. Somebody tried to drive a car into their business and you're like, well, we don't want them. I don't, I don't want them here. And it's like, well, yo, what do you mean? This isn't their fault. This is a victim. This is some victim blaming shit here. In and the police were came back out. Um, and this, it's just crazy. We just don't need something like this. Garcia says he's helping to gather signatures for a petition. Last November, on the same night, three teenagers were also arrested for attempting to rob the only two Union City dispensaries, Lemonade and Floor. Both are in commercial areas. We just told our city, you know, enough's enough. You got two, uh, let's stay with that. Now, I also spoke to one of Floor's customers who did not want to be on camera, but she told me that she would prefer to have a new location on Alvarado Niles Road, but she is still concerned about it being close to a school. Now, I also reached Why? out to Embark for comment, but they didn't respond in time for this report. Mike? LaMonica Peters live tonight in Union City. LaMonica, thank you. The number... Yo, I don't understand. Like, I don't understand. Like, this is like... <clears throat> By like all measures, cannabis is far less harmful than alcohol. And we don't like blame the fucking the alcohol industry because liquor stores are targets of burglary and armed robbery at a higher rate than other kinds of businesses. Again, I think it might be because the liquor store is more likely to have cash on hand because people might tend to pay with cash at a liquor store a little more often. A lot of people who are unbanked might use the liquor store to pay bills, that kind of thing. And so I don't under, I don't understand the deal here that what's happening here is because the banks, because of federal law, a lot of, uh, dispensaries, they can't take your card on premises. So you have to pay with cash. And so, yeah, like maybe a person inclined to fucking steal money from somebody would think, well, this is a good place to go. And you put on top of that, that when these things do happen, I'm assuming that the fucking local pigs aren't like in some big fucking hurry fucking save the day for the fucking cannabis shop which is totally fucked up because they're following all the rules paying all the taxes doing everything they need to have to have a storefront oftentimes doing more than they need to do and like most of the places i've been in like i usually just buy weed i guess on the gray market right but when i've bought weed at, at dispensaries even the one in the tenderloin i went to the, the, they're fucking they're really nice on the inside it's like a nice experience It's like a fucking nice experience where an adult can go and buy a legal product. That's it. That's what a fucking, that's what these dispensaries are. And they're targets of crime because the fucking, nobody will fucking bank with them. And so I guess that's their fault. Anyway, <clears throat> on to the next story. Uh, apparently a uh, boba tea shop opened in Concord and uh, drew some scrutiny. Oh, apparently, I don't, they're not good for the kids. Not, don't, don't want the boba tea in my neighborhood either. They might uh, get exposed to some aloe vera. <laughs> Opening of a new boba tea shop in Concord advertised on social media raised fears about the size of the crowd that might show up. The store's owner says he was threatened by police for inviting car enthusiasts to join the festivities. John Ramos has that story. Wait, what? You'd think the city of Concord would be happy about the grand opening of its newest small business, but instead the police have warned the owner not to have too many customers show up today. What?
It was opening day for the Milk Tea Lab in Concord, and as a first-time business owner, Ayani Muniz knew he had to do something to get the word out. We're not a huge corporation, so in order for us to get our name and ourselves out there, we have to advertise. Now with today's technology, social media is key. It's crucial. And I have a bunch of buddies that I network with, collab, and they spread the word. One of those buddies posted this invite on a site called Bay Area Car Meets, inviting car owners to support the opening. But it caught the attention of Concord Police, and Ayani says a lieutenant threatened so him. So there might be a way in which if you do a car show in the parking lot, you need a permit, but I'm not sure the cops should come and threaten you. And ticketing if he tried to hold an, quote, unpermitted event. She came to my business and just to let me know in my face that this is not going to happen. And I said, you know what, this is my grand opening. I have my attorney stating that we could still have our grand opening, just not the car meet. But people are more than welcome to join us at any time. The tea lab is next to a long shuttered Kmart and about a week ago Ayani found the entire parking lot in front had been cordoned off with caution tape. I came out, this was all here, so I don't know who put it up, but most likely it would be the, the police department of Concord. Because th those are their quotation words, unpermitted events, no unpermitted events. So at 11 a.m., the car meet that wasn't a car meet began, with lots of expensive vehicles arriving, their young passengers filling the boba shop with grand opening customers. Back outside, the car enthusiasts didn't seem very surprised that they drew the suspicions of law enforcement. I don't know. I think everybody's suspicious of something they don't understand. I think if you're part of the car scene, there's nothing to be suspicious about. It's just like-minded people going and hanging out. No different than a bowling league, a baseball team. The yeah, car meets are cool. I'm not even into cars. I'd go hang out at a car meet. Fuck yeah. Do you think this was an overreaction by the city? Absolutely. I don't think there's anything to overreact to. It's literally just a park and chill. And um, this isn't rocket science. You can literally look to see what kind of car meet it's going to be. So this isn't like they're, um, you know, they should see the post and be like, oh, this is going to be a sideshow. These never turn into sideshows. Ayani was, he was to too expensive to do that. He just did what he could to make his first day a success in a shopping center that has been pretty quiet for a long time. I look at the fucking parking no lots empty. They're like, oh, don't don't fill this up with cars. Just chop at your business. Fuck the police. At the end of the day, everything will be fine. At the end of the day, everything was fine. Thanks to social media, the store enjoyed lots of new customers, even though none of them had a permit to be there. <laughs> the news getting a little salty. Yeah, like people like that. The parking lot's empty. A new business came in. They did a really good job promoting their grand opening. They got help from the community, like the car community. And the car community is like, yeah, we'll park. We'll go. We'll come hang out, have some boba tea, and like let people check out our cool ass cars. Police are like, nope. Up next, we got some great news as a uh, fire season heats up. Uh, East San Jose has announced that they're going to have their first uh, official fireworks display. Uh, mind you, these are generally fairly safe, but uh, it's not that the it's not like there's never been a uh, wildfire set off by an officially sanctioned. Uh, Fireworks display. I'm not going to go. Fuck going to fuck going to San Jose. I'll I'll go to the city if I go check out fireworks. Anyway, here's the story from NBC Bay Area. People living in East San Jose are finally getting their own. City is sponsoring a 4th of July fireworks show with the hopes of preventing many of the illegal shows that can cause fires or injure people. NBC Bay Area's Damien Trujillo is at Lake Cunningham where the preps will soon get underway. Organizers say Lake Cunningham is an ideal east side spot for this official event, and many here feel it's about time. <laughs> Lake Cunningham is quite picturesque with the east. Also, a lot of brown. I don't know, maybe cancel the fucking fireworks, yo. And on 4th of July, the area will light a up brown. its first ever official fireworks show. Growing up here in East San Jose, we always had to go to downtown or Alma Lake. That's like, but what, uh, but so you, did, did you get to... Okay, so people who don't live in San Jose, uh, to get from the east side to San Jose on a bicycle is 15 minutes. Uh, if you take the bus, it's like 10. Sponsor a show here in East San Jose in my backyard for my neighbors and my families. It's something I'm really proud of. Councilman Domingo Candelas had to raise $50,000 in private donations to make it happen. Come the 4th, the park will be closed to traffic for safety reasons. So the city is encouraging people to walk or bike to the event or park in surrounding neighborhoods. You're going to come? Wait, park in surrounding? No, the people in the surrounding neighborhoods are going to get pissed now. Yes, I'm going to come. 
Uh, I'm very excited about uh, this event, uh, Fourth of July. Why are you excited? About uh, the fireworks. Pablito Concepcion says that as an immigrant from the Philippines, he appreciates the Independence Day celebrations of democratic countries. Pues me parece bien para toda la... Maria Sanchez is glad the East Side is getting its own show so families can get together and celebrate. Another reason Candela's push for the event is the brown hills above the lake and the fire danger. The hope is to deter some of the many illegal fireworks shows in streets and parks. Okay, so the ones in the streets are very unlikely to actually catch anything on fire because the street isn't flammable and the <clears throat> trees are not likely to catch on fire. Uh, most of the new housing construction, the roofs are really difficult to catch on fire. The safest place to do fireworks is actually like the, in <clears throat> what they used to call the concrete jungle because there's less shit to catch on fire. This, this, this right here, unsafe place to do fireworks. <laughs> Uh, with a big enough show like we're doing this year, uh, it'll save response times from our firefighters and it'll it'll save communities, you know, endangering themselves, trying to celebrate in a healthy way. Next year, Candelas hopes to make it an all-day event with carnival rides. The councilman says it's what his community deserves on the 4th. Damian Trujillo, NBC Bay Area News. No, that's a bad idea. <clears throat> They're like doing it in a, a dried out park. Like, well, like, I don't think it's going to deter people from doing um, fireworks that are not sanctioned by the city. I think you're looking at two different demographics of people, two different two different groups of people, basically. <clears throat> but uh, I don't know. Hopefully the east side doesn't catch on fire because of this fucking bright idea they had. Who knows? Up next. <laughs> Try keep trying. We're going to reinvent downtown San Jose, everybody. Longtime listeners to Down Ballot will know that... Um, the councilman and I, mostly I, uh, have been complaining a lot about the state of entertainment in the city of San Jose. Uh, some of it's that the city doesn't want anything open past nine because they're weird. And uh, some of it is uh, certain people who are, um, I guess, friendly to what used to be local love who are uh, gatekeepers and they're uh, not letting anybody new come in and organize events or do anything really. And so there's that problem is twofold. When events do happen, it's the same group of 12 or 15 different bands. And uh, the problem is that there's just nothing to do after nine o'clock, except for the already existing uh, uh, nightlife. But I think they want to reinvent it and turn it into downtown Campbell, which they'll never be able to do. Downtown San Jose is reinventing itself. City leaders can see they'll need a new approach. They're looking for fresh ideas to draw more people into the downtown corridor. NBC's Damien Trujillo has the details. San Jose's mayor acknowledged... Boy, doesn't that look like a fun place? Look at where he... He could have chosen to set up in front of like a place with a patio where people are doing something. He's like, oh, I'm next to a bit, the office building and um, and an and office building. We need to do more to lure people downtown. So we took a walking tour with him to see what exactly the city's new ideas are. <laughs> The mayor says this is number one. When oh, shit. Cover bands, everybody. We'll fix this. We'll fix the downtown with cover bands. To bringing back the crowds to downtown. More social and cultural events, festivals and live bands to lure the crowds. That civic pride really starts in downtown. Today, we walked with the mayor to get a glimpse of what it's going to take to convince more people to come. The city expects to attract up to one million people to the downtown over the summer for those social events. When it comes to a clean and safe downtown, the mayor calls it table stakes. And so hold on. They had a massive event. They had a big fucking party in Discovery Meadow that's in front of the Children's Discovery Museum. A lot of people came. It was dance music and hell people came out. I don't think that cover band that they were showing is going to draw the crowd that the DJs at this event drew. But there, there's going to be no mention of this event. There's been no press coverage of the event. It's a work in progress. Javier Rodriguez says he used to visit downtown a lot. Not anymore. Now it's like, shoot, I'm walking around to see who's going to try to mug me or something. You know, it's crazy. Wait, what? No. The 
mayor I'm hope I was I'd be hoping for more of that I'd like more action the city is investing more in foot and bike patrols and in the immediate uh, co cleaning copy of shops up to something and buildings another downtown priority is housing one of the key strategies for taking downtown San Jose into the future and, and really to the next level is to build more residential to have residential density in the downtown believe it or not the downtown towers are at near capacity with just a five percent vacancy rate the key now is getting all those people to shop where they live transit is another priority along with these so-called pop-up shops where entrepreneurs fill vacant storefronts with minimal financial risk usually one-year leases it's worked so far for la paloma imports which shares a space with two other stores at paseo de san antonio this is um i mean barely a year lease but we for sure plan on expanding more and seeing what we could do more in the future National conventions are also returning to San Jose. It feels great. I mean, we're seeing a real rebound. A city trying to market its downtown to a 2024 audience. Damian Trujillo, NBC Bay Area News. There was like no mention of anything that might be open late. Again, no mention of the big fucking party that was in Discovery Meadow. <clears throat> no mention of anything that actually sounds fun. I mean, those pop-up shops are cool. You probably get cool shit in there, a lot of niche items and stuff, but you don't revitalize it. You don't revitalize a downtown like that. It's, it's going to be like dining out, entertainment. Um, entertainment ranging from dive bars to kind of classy, like ultra lounge type joints, the kind of place I don't like the ultra lounge, but like that, that's all this stuff. It's going to be, yeah, it's going to be, <clears throat> but they keep trying to do this fucking like overly, they're trying to do like a sanitized version of like a real city and it's been failing. It's been failing basically since fucking the early 2000s when they based, when they shut down uh, the South of First Street area essentially. And it's never coming back if they fucking keep trying to demand that it come back exactly the way that they think it should. It should. So the San Jose Police Department has launched a, a most wanted uh, page for on their social media because I guess uh, San Jose's got a lot of uh, people on the lam, on the lam. They're on the run. San Jose Police turning to social media to help their investigators find and catch some of their most wanted fugitives. And KTV South Bay reporter Jesse Gary live now in San Jose with more on that story for us. Jesse. Heather, good evening to you. San Jose police already use social media such as the X platform to inform the public when their officers are working the case. Now they're going to use social media to help them find wanted fugitives. This really is just kind of a new platform that we really need to find outstanding, da dangerous and violent criminals. Um, that we have go, on, go on Twitter, snitch on your neighbor. But are still outstanding. San Jose police announcing today their homicide unit has created a wanted fugitive page on Instagram and on Facebook. The goal is to increase awareness about the most dangerous felons who are wanted for past homicides and other crimes and have yet to be caught. Some of the criminals have left the United States and are trying to avoid the law by laying low elsewhere. Pictures and information are being posted to the pages and updated as need be. The social media pages, both Instagram and Facebook, will update with photos and descriptions of people that we're still looking for. Ooh, you that want some snitches? Put it on next door. That'll bring new leads and tips for us. So it gives you, first of all, the potential of a global audience, but more important, a place where any consumer locally can go, uh, look at the pictures, and if they've seen the person, go ahead and turn them in. Somebody out there knows these people, and they can go on Facebook or Instagram and see exactly what they look like. Pages are operating now. Just go to the San Jose Police website and search Most Wanted. That'll give you a link to either Instagram or Facebook. You can take don't, a look don't, and don't, see don't, if don't, you don't recognize don't. anyone who's wanted, and then you can tip off police. We're live outside San Jose Police headquarters this evening. Jesse Gary, KTVU, Fox 2 News. Heather, back up to you. In Oakland. Yeah, yeah, and I'm guessing they'll, they'll see how well the rollout is and then decide whether they want to keep updating, adding more suspects to those pages. 
I'm sure they will, Heather. I mean, this is not necessarily new t new technology. I mean, you know that uh, the FBI and other law enforcement uses the same thing, puts it out on social media. So San Jose is going to try the same thing. Okay, we'll see if it does, in fact, bear some results. Hopefully it will. Uh, really appreciate it. Jesse Gary, they are in San Jose. Thank you. Also in the Somebody in chat said this seems bad somehow. Yeah, people are going to fucking, people are going to mis misidentify people. That's always been the problem with this, is like, <clears throat> and I, I don't remember, I, it's been such a long time, I heard somebody talking about these though, and it was something like, something like 80 or 90% of the reports of uh, somebody on these lists or whatever, turn out to like not even be the same fucking person. <laughs> I, I want to say it was even higher. It was like 95% or some like ridiculous shit. So it's just like, it's just like busybodies. They're like, oh, I think I, that looks like the guy that worked at the grocery store. Now you got the fucking police hassling some fucking checker at the grocery store. <laughs> it's such a bad fucking idea. Anyway, up next, we got a uh, San Francisco Unified School District. <clears throat> uh, not, a, not a place where a lot of people can afford to raise kids. Uh, they have to close and merge schools, and it seems like uh, the community members have only heard, uh, heard half of that. One by one, parents, students, and concerned citizens in San Francisco took to the microphone to tell those leading the San Francisco Unified School District that they are concerned about school closures and the decision on what schools to close or combine. For me, there's no merging. They're either closing or closing, right? They're just using the word merging to kind of cover um, the closings. This is a city uh, where there's boom and there's bust, there's bust, and we also have to be prepared for the boom. The district says that since the start of the 2017 school year, there has been a 4,000 student decline in San Francisco, meaning much less funding and meaning changes must be made. San Francisco Unified Superintendent Matt Wayne says this is a problem that is not limited to San Francisco. San Francisco, the Bay Area, California is facing you know, a declining population, um, you know, fewer kindergarten births, we have less students. There have also been concerns amongst many about possible mismanaged funds within the district. The school board has not yet released a list of schools recommended for closure in 2025, saying that will come in the fall, likely September. Independent third-party researchers will make that list by calculating composite scores of schools based on 50% equity, 25% excellence, and 25% effective use of resources. And if the recommendations, you know, are, um, you know, dis you know, uh, are more significantly impacting our, you know, African-American and Latino students. But I get a sense that from this board, that's not going to be acceptable. Wayne saying that changes would then be made. Still, though, you can see all the students from June Jordan School of Equity who showed up at Tuesday's meeting, along with parents from Jose Ortega Elementary School. Are they concerned about that school yeah. closing? Yeah, all small schools are concerned about closure wow. right now. But we've been told that we might close all right. We, we've been told that the language program might move. We, we've been told we could cut, become 100% immersion. We don't know, and it's creating this sense of anxiety amongst parents. A lot of parents are already saying, I might just well leave San Francisco. For parents right now, though, a waiting game for the list of schools that could close or move certain programs elsewhere. J.R. Stone, ABC 7 News. So this is, <clears throat> this is all in how you do it. If, if there's a lot of notice given and they talk about it at the school, like <clears throat> maybe you have an assembly or something, and they talk about it at the schools and they're like way out in front of it, I think people are going to be less pissed. Especially because the parents would go, ah, I didn't know anything about this. And the kid goes, I did. <laughs> Maybe you should uh, fucking read the news or something, mom. I don't know what to tell you. But <clears throat> the problem is that they don't, they're going to want to wait till the last minute, hopefully, hoping that there, some kind of funding comes through so they don't have to do it. And then when you have to do it last minute, it's going to be a fucking shit show and nobody's going to be happy. With that kind of like decline in enrollment, then yeah, you're going to have to combine some schools. Just do what you can to f keep everybody informed and have like kind of a long runway for it so that people know what's coming. Up next, <clears throat> some new California laws actually took effect yesterday on July 1st. Let's see what those laws are. 
Well, as of about five hours ago, a slate of new California laws took effect, which mean all sorts of changes, including a ban on junk fees. This will mostly affect you when you uh, book a hotel room or buy concert tickets. But in a late twist, restaurants will be spared the worst of the ban. A last minute deal by lawmakers allows restaurants to keep those fees, provided that they the added charges are clearly disclosed. One diner says he doesn't expect to see much difference. I've gotten used to the fees being there, so at least it'll be apparent before I order what I'm actually ordering, kind of what the total is going to be. Now, some restaurants across the state have struggled to remain open, which is why lawmakers introduced that last minute legislation. The goal is to provide more menu transparency without further harming the industry. And that's just one of the laws taking effect today. Another is the so-called no roofies law. Many bars and nightclubs now have to provide date rape testing kits for patrons. Those businesses will also be required to post signage informing customers that those kits are available. And a new law takes effect today benefiting new renters. Any new rental contract can now only require one month security deposit. Already Existing rental agreements with larger deposits won't be affected. Landlords still... Oh, they should give those people back that money. Fuck that. ...ask for additional fees at the end of a lease, period, um, provided that the damage exceeds one month's rent. And a new law makes it easier for people who need to repair their devices. The right to repair law now requires manufacturers to provide customers or repair shops with the parts, the tools, the instructions needed to service or repair an electronic device. The law applies to any cell phone costing more than $50, along with home appliances, TVs, video recording equipment, and such. So <clears throat> the thing about the restaurants, who fucking cares? I always thought the restaurants should just raise the price. Instead of adding a 3.5% fee, just add a dollar to some stuff. You might end up actually getting more money. People people spending, what, $21 instead of 20 on something? They're not going to care that much. But that fee that, that, that you assess, that fucking annoys people. So don't do it. It's fucking annoying. It seems petty. <clears throat> um, the rental stuff. I fucking make that shit retroactive and make those fucking landlords give people back that fucking outrageous amount of money. <clears throat> I remember when we were shopping for an apartment, uh, the last apartment I actually had to shop for. Uh, the the main reason we picked one place over the other is the one place wanted first last first month's last month's rent plus a twenty five hundred dollar deposit, and the rent on the that apartment at the time was. 1150 so we didn't choose that one we chose the one that was a little more expensive might have been nicer it was before i moved to campbell uh, when we moved to campbell actually i just the same property management company i said i'd like a bigger apartment and then they found me one and there was no bullshit they even rolled over my deposit but it but it was like you know it was a normal amount <clears throat> i don't know if this means they can't charge first last and deposit or if it just means that they can charge you the first and last month's rent, but then they can, on top of that, tack a month's deposit, because that's still bullshit. That's still bullshit. Though, if you ever get in that situation and they um, <clears throat> take your first month's rent and you're there for a while, and then they come and hit you for the last month's rent, you can be like, I already paid it. And then they go ahead and tell you, oh, well, the rent's now 3000 And, you know, when you started here, it was, you know... 1600 and you're like well i don't know you should have renegotiated that i paid the last month's rent according to this rent rental agreement uh <clears throat> the place we left it was interesting because they tried to hit uh I, I wasn't on the lease they tried to hit the leaseholders the last place and the leaseholder was just like i already paid the last month it was here and there here in the lease <laughs> oopsie oopsie so that's the end of the docket. We have and another thing always. It's always, it's usually a car versus a building or an animal story. <clears throat> this is the animal story. Oh, real quick. Also, right to repair. Uh, those laws suck because they don't ever like tell you any. They don't ever say anything about how the uh, device, like the items that the company makes available for repair have to be reasonably priced. <laughs> so you could have bought a $500 phone, crack the screen, and then you take it to the repair shop. And then, oh, we could go you know, get, get a phone from, uh, get a screen from Samsung, uh, screen from Samsung is 380. There's no rules against that. So the right to repair laws actually aren't great. <clears throat> Mind you, if there's an aftermarket, 
the shop's like, actually, uh, we have a screen from a phone somebody uh, dropped off here, and uh, we just bought it from for 50 bucks because it doesn't turn on. We can give that screen a try. So the aftermarket and stuff might help with that. We'll see. <clears throat> oh, look at this. This is a story about pride. There was a coyote hanging out on the pink triangle at, uh, the, the, at the hill in uh, Twin Peaks, which is cute, I guess. We used to walk up to that pink triangle. I think it's probably fenced off now. There was a surprise visitor today at the Pink Triangle up on San Francisco's Twin Peaks. Look at it. Triangle founder captured this video of a coyote getting ready for pride. As you may know, the Triangle is an annual display in the city. It's reclaiming the Pink Triangle, which was once used to label and shame, but has become a symbol of resistance, hope, and love. And that coyote's on board. Hell yeah. <clears throat> That's cool. That's cool. I mean, they needed, a, they needed an animal interest story, so. Anyway, that's uh, down ballot. It's uh, unfortunate that uh, the councilman couldn't join me, but you know these things happen. Uh, technical difficulties do happen. I managed to more or less survive. Um, it's the ambient temperature in this room right now is ninety five point two degrees, though so things are uh, cooling off. And when I pop open the door to the studio and play a couple songs, we should drop by like five or six degrees here. Um, <clears throat> anyway, that's been down ballot. <clears throat> it's the uh, eighth most good most goodest local podcast about news in California, according to some guy who has a website that wanted me to pay him money, I think, to make it the sixth most on his website. And I obviously didn't pay him any money. <clears throat> this show's live every uh, Tuesday, 7.30 p.m. Pacific, right here on Twitch, twitch.tv slash Media. Though, <clears throat> if stuff allows, we may push it uh, later uh, some nights uh, just because of the heat. Um, this isn't as bad as the South San Jose studio, but it is pretty fucking warm in here right now. <clears throat> and, uh, yeah, I don't know. Support the project, echoplexmedia.com. We got, uh, this is going to be Locals by Audible Smoke Signal, and we'll play uh, one or two more other songs while I uh, switch some things around and uh, try, to, try to cool this room off a little bit. See everybody for public comment. Oh, by the way, uh, public comment tonight is Shasta. <laughs> To get the party started Pick up my phone just to check and see who's calling Dress up real nice for the ladies at the bar And I'm driving in my car just to get to where they are Here at the local scene is where I plant my feet It's where I smoke my cigarette and I hold my drink I look at all my friends, they're all blazing greens Here at the front of the stage waiting for MTV Where are those guys who's standing next to me With a pipe in his hand ready to blaze for me About five minutes later we're all singing We I get the fuck up on stage and like the scene, yeah. We do what we want, and what we want is to jam. So sit back and enjoy the band. We do what we want, and what we want is to jam. So sit back and enjoy the band. Enjoy the band. I turn and head back to the bar for a refill, man, because you know where we are. We're headed out to the car To smoke another one what? And another one Woo! Now just when the magic starts kicking in Now here we left playing And you know it's time to head in Alright everybody now it's time to grab a new drink Spark it if you got it And then pass it to me yeah. We do what we want And what we want is to jam So sit back and enjoy the band We do what we want we want is to jam, so sit back and enjoy the band, enjoy that band. Last up on the bill for the show tonight, it's down and dirty and five, so we're headed outside. To spark up another joint, now who's got my light? A stoner E, of course, shouldn't you be inside? I'm all up in this bitch, being who I gotta be. I'm fucked up like the U.S. economy. The truth is, is that I don't think logically. Stoner E, take you on a psychedelic. 
Delhi got a seat. Now inside motherfuckers is rocking me. And outside shit, we smoke a lot of rockin' me. Rockin' the roller, you the sexy groovy jockin' me. Ain't too drunk to fuck, but I'll probably do a slap on We do what we want. What we wanna do. And what we want is to jam. So sit back and enjoy the band. We want us to jam, so sit back and enjoy the band. Molly say the he like jamming, and he hope he like jamming too. Well, I gotta say, thank you, Bob. We do, yes, I gotta say, thank you, Bob. We do. Well, Bob Molly say the he like jamming, and he hope he like jamming too. Well, I gotta say, thank you, Bob. We do, yes, I gotta say, thank you, Bob. We do. Sit back and